Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Christensen with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's program, an unscripted look at script type, the design of Snell Roundhand with Matthew Carter and Jill Gage. This program is generously sponsored by the Caxton Club of Chicago. Welcome also to the Caxton, Caxton Club members who are joining us tonight. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. Today, the Newberry reopened its doors to readers and visitors. Re-reopened, I should say. You can visit our website, newberry.org, to make an appointment to do research in the reading rooms. Or you can stop by the library without an appointment Tuesday through Friday afternoons to visit our exhibition halls and our Rosenberg bookshop. Following Illinois state guidelines for COVID-19 restrictions and for the safety of our community, our public programs remain virtual. Visit newberry.org to learn more about our many digital resources, online classes, and virtual public programs like this one. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. Today's program is one example of the Newberry Library's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. During the program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As time permits, our speakers will respond to your questions. Now it is my, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jill Gage. She is custodian of the John M. Wing Foundation on the History of Printing and bibliographer for British literature and history at the Newberry. This program came about because Jill is curating the 2022 Newberry exhibition, A Show of Hands, which will investigate the intersections of handwriting and technology since the 17th century in the United States. Jill, let me hand things over to you. Thank you, Karin, and thank you everyone um, for joining us today. As custodian of the John M. Wing Foundation on the History of Printing, I oversee one of the most important history of printing collections in the world. Two particular strengths of the collection are typography um, from the 15th century to the present day and printed calligraphy materials. So it's for this reason that for about the last year, 18 months, I've been working on the handwriting exhibition that Karin referenced, um, which explores in part how printing technologies from the 16th century to the present day have shaped the ways in which we think about and use handwriting and where type and print, manuscript and print overlap. The exhibition was originally intended to be up right now, um, but has thankfully been postponed until September, 2022. So our program today was originally meant to coincide with the exhibition in part because Snell Roundhand um, is featured alongside other 20th century um, script fonts like Mistral and Zapfino. With that, I am delighted and honored to introduce our speaker, Matthew Carter, one of the best known and most important type designers in the world. Mr. Carter has created type in every possible way you can make type over the last 500 years, um, which is quite astounding. He trained as a punch cutter at Enschede in the Netherlands, later moving to Mergenthaler Linotype, where um, in part he created type with photocomposition, which we'll be talking about today. In 1981, he co-founded Bitstream, the first digital font foundry. And in 1991, he co-founded Carter and Cone. He continues to make digital fonts today. Um, and in recent years, he has also designed a wood type for the Hamilton Wood Type Museum. Um, and we actually have two upcoming programs with Hamilton. Mr. Carter has also designed type for publications, including the New York Times, Newsweek, and Le Monde, amongst many others. In 2010, he was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, and equally as impressive to me, um, he was the subject of a 2005 New Yorker profile. Uh, his work is so prolific that he has been called 
quote, the most widely read man in the world. I'm sure that gets used in every single introduction, but I had to use it. Today, we are lucky not only to see his work, but to hear him talk about it. So without further ado, I turn things to Matthew Carter. Thank you, Jill. In uh, 1965, I was hired by Mervyn's Hall of Linotype in Brooklyn as a type designer. The reason for hiring me was that by the mid 1960s, photocomposition, the typesetting technology that was replacing the hot metal slug casting original linotype machine had established itself commercially. Driven by the trend in the printing industry from letterpress to offset lithography. By the time I joined, Mergenthaler's in-house letter drawing department had largely completed the adaptation of the hot metal type library to cold type <coughs> photocomposition. There was an opportunity then to consider whether there might be kinds of type that had been technically impossible to make as liner type brass mattresses, but that could be made as film fonts. In other words, whether the change from three-dimensional type to two-dimensional type opened up possibilities for new designs. My boss, Mike Parker, knew that script type, that's to say types that imitate handwriting, formal or informal, had been impossible to make well for slug machines, and that Mergenthal had never really attempted historically uh, to make them at all. But Mike reckoned that because the new photo technology was free of the mechanical limitations of metal typecasting, <clears throat> that we should explore the idea of script types in the new medium. I loved this idea. I'd never designed a script face. And I uh, started to research uh, a model that exploited the new technical freedom to the utmost as a, as a challenge. To me, that meant a formal script with a steep slant and letters that joined uh, cursively. Being English myself, I suppose I naturally turned patriotically for inspiration to the English writing masters of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, and was quickly drawn to the work of this man. First slide, please. There we go. You probably can't see it on the screen, but it says at the bottom that he was 20, 23 years old when this rather impressive portrait uh, was made. Uh, I also found this engraving from one of Snell's copy books printed in 1714. Um, the, the alphabet at the bottom looks pretty much familiar to us with two exceptions, I think. One is the long S, looking confusingly like an F, and the other is a form of W, which mercifully went out of uh, use uh, fairly soon. We may talk a bit more about these uh, uh, later on. So copy books, instruction manuals with engraved plates, such as this, on how to write the round hand, the preferred business hand, universally readable, with examples of its use, were produced by Snell and his rival scribes. They were very competitive. As well as penmanship, writing masters taught arithmetic and accountancy. I suppose the modern equivalent of their teaching would be touch typing, doing documents in Microsoft Word and spreadsheets in Excel for bookkeeping. In other words, basic clerical skills for entry into business. What got my rather startled attention when I saw this plate was those diagrammatic letters at the top of the page with their, their geometric construction. How was an ingenious clerk, as Snell called his pupils, supposed to replicate these excruciatingly precise and regimented letter forms by hand with a quill pen? Uh, the next slide is a, is a detail. Yeah, look at that. I'm glad I wasn't an aspiring clerk in 1714 trying to write those daunting letters. I would have failed the penmanship class. But as a type designer, 250 years later, I was extremely grateful for their structural formality. I respectfully adopted Charles Snell's model, this one, 
for my new script, and at the risk of travesty, gave it his name, Snell Roundhand. It was uh, released for the line of film in 1966. Next slide, please. This is the complete title of that copy book from the previous slide, uh, Reset in My Type. Notice the words mathematically demonstrating. Snell, like his rivals, was a mathematician as well as a penman and taught both things. So perhaps it was uh, sort of natural to him to use the idea of imposing standard rules that looked to us impossibly rigid for cursive handwriting. Uh, perhaps, that, perhaps his interest in mathematics makes that uh, understandable. Uh, next slide. Here's an enlargement of Snell's plate of the round hand. And in the next slide, the same letters set in the typeface. Those vertical bars I've drawn in uh, indicate the width assigned to each letter. And this slide, the next one, the color slide, makes the point really better. Those alternating blue and red bars, bands, are the width. On the linotype hot metal machine, every letter would have been confined within its rectangular bounding box. It was actually a piece of brass, a, a, a matrix. I've colored it blue in, in this case. Uh, the, the F, it, the width of the F is, it, is blue here. How could you squash that free flowing F into the narrow blue box? Impossible. Uh, but in the optics of a photocomposing machine, that physical constraint has vanished. It's technically obsolete. We're in two dimensions now, not three. And the F can exceed its width and stretch into or across the width of a couple of other letters before and after it. This freedom, which we sort of take for granted nowadays, was actually quite intoxicating 55 years ago. Snell, this typeface, was a sort of celebration of the emancipation from hot metal constraints in type making, as well as it added a, a typeface in a new category to the line of film library. Next slide, please. This slide is about the connections in a connecting script. The example in the upper line uses a hairline to hairline butt joint, with the result that every letter must have the same lead in and lead out strokes. The joints are uniform throughout the type. The lower line is Snell, which took a different and more flexible approach, again offered by phototype setting technology. There are no lead in strokes. All joints are, in fact, overlaps. The lead out stroke extends into the following letter. It makes a very secure joint. It also allows different kinds of connection. The F, as you see, joins with its crossbar. The N and most of the other letters with the lead out hairline. The O and I think the B and V and W, just a few letters, uh, join with that little catenary loop. These varying joints move the typographic rendering closer to its calligraphic ancestry and give it a more natural cursive flow. I'm happy to say that after Snell Roundhead had been out of the world for a few years, Logan thought I would move to commission two heavier weights, bold and black. Next slide. This is my preliminary sketch for one of these heavier weights although actually it is not. All preliminary drawings of type are actually fakes or almost all. What happens is this, when a typeface is designed and manufactured, ready to be released, the marketing department comes to the designer to say they're preparing publicity material, specimens and so on. And may they have your sketches because they make good illustrations. You of course tell them there are no sketches, Nobody makes drawings like this, really. Um, so the marketers tell you to kindly make them. So this sketch is, in fact, a, a post-rationalization. I did, of course, make production drawings for these heavier weights, but 
I did make uh, sketches beforehand. Uh, next slide. I thought I should include at least one uh, slide of the character set of Snell caps in that case. This is the original weight of Snell, not the boulder weights that I was just mentioning. This is vintage 1966. Next slide, yes. This is a, a sort of bittersweet slide for me. Um, but sometime in the 1980s, the linotype companies stopped supporting their photocomposing machines. They stopped making the equipment and they stopped making the fonts. The type world had gone digital and so had they. The whole photo department of the linotype factory were dismantled and trucked to the landfill and with it, my drawings for Snell, Helvetica Compressed, Cascade, Gander Ronde, in fact, all the faces I did at Linotype uh, uh, ended up in the landfill. Had I known at the time, I would have tried to salvage them, but I had moved on from Linotype then, and I, I did not know that this was happening. However, after the font of Snell had been manufactured, some cluts in the factory got red opaquing fluid on this one drawing, the cap D. It was sent back to me with an apologetic note and a request that I should clean it up and return it. And I'm sure I meant to do that. But meanwhile, I put it in a box and I forgot about it for 40 some odd years. I suppose I was annoyed back in 1966 when I saw the damage to the D. But when I found the drawing again, all those years later, I was absolutely delighted because thanks to that Klutz, whoever he was in the factory, I do at least have one drawing from that whole period of my life. I framed it. Uh, I never cleaned it up. I framed it with red smears and all. Uh, the letter, by the way, is about six inches high. And it's drawn on scratchboard, which is what we used uh, in those days. Well, I look back over half a century at working with Mike Parker on Snell. With great pleasure, it was actually really an adventure. And both at Mergenthal and since, I've always enjoyed contact with engineers to understand or try and understand technical innovations with the aim of taking full advantage of their potential in design. Next slide. A lot has changed since 1966, but still round hand has actually stayed the same. You see it here at the top of this slide, it's a digital font nowadays, but it's indistinguishable from its original photo version. It has a single form for each letter. And, uh, it's designed for a font of limited capacity. I still see Snell in use quite a lot nowadays. I only wish I had a, uh, a, <laughs> a royalty on it. <laughs> the three lines below are new, on the other hand, and are work in progress. They represent a very significant change, technical change. All are actually from the same font of the same typeface. They may look different, but they're actually from the same font. They are digital, of course, and they take advantage of the so-called open type technology that allows multiple forms of each letter within the same font, and virtually open-ended font capacity. The second line down shows the new type in its most sober form, looking like a hybrid between italic and script. The, the, the capitals are essentially italic. In the second line down, the, 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 the new type is, is really, uh, has sort of morphed into a full blown script with its own appropriate capitals, and with more connections between letters, with more flourished descending strokes. The last line is the most extravagant form with swash letters. You might, in fact, in practice, choose not to use that very exuberant cap W because it crowds the dot of the I in the last line. But there are other Ws that you could choose instead. So that's my last slide. As I say, it's, it's work in progress. And by the way, it's by no means the first script type to use the open type logic to implement contextual substitutions and other refinements. It, it is just the first that I've worked on myself. I show it to make the point that just as Snell Roundhand took advantage of a 
technical shift, a technical advance at the time from metal to film. This face is part of a new generation of digital types that seizes upon even greater freedom of expression for us type designers. You know, the engineers push the technology. We type designers rub our hands and gleefully see what we can do with it. I was doing that 55 years ago, and I guess I'm still doing it today. Now that's my last slide, uh, Jill. Uh, I know you have uh, <laughs> some questions for me, which I will be very happy to try to uh, answer. Yes. Um, thank you so much. I, I have so many questions about every slide. Um, I, um, I will say that I have a couple questions to start us off with, but for people in the audience, if you have questions, please, please, please put them in the Q&A so I do not dominate the rest of this presentation. Um, I'm so happy to hear you really talk about the way you as a designer have embraced technology, changing technologies over the last 60 years of your career and, um, I will point out, interestingly, one of the things that fascinates me about this original Snell, Snell's original writing manual is that it used engraving and um, the evolution or the use of engraving in the 17th century really changed the way that writing books could be made. Um, and so it's just, and I, I see photo composition and digital type as sort of an extension of that kind of technology. You know, engraving was entirely different. They were not making individual pieces of type. Um, but I wanted to, uh, in some ways, I think, um, Photo composition is, was really revolutionary, as you pointed out, in freeing you as a designer. But I was wondering if for our audience, you could talk a little bit about the distinctions between hot metal typecasting and photo composition. Uh, sure. Um, first of all, the were script faces <clears throat> made as metal type, uh, handset type. They were designed and manufactured very ingeniously uh, so that they could overlap a bit and join. But my point was that on the linotype machine, that was totally impossible. Uh, the, the, the way the linotype worked, it assembled a line of uh, brass matrices and cast a, a whole line, a line O type, uh, all at the same time. And that was very constraining. I mean, it was bad enough with italics. The design of linotype italics was a really tricky thing, uh, even with a, with a, with a slight uh, uh, slant. Um, all that went away uh, when the third dimension disappeared. And there was this kind of, as I described, rather intoxicating period when we decided, oh my God, you know, there are some things we could do uh, that we couldn't do previously on the linotype. Um, but I mustn't suggest that there were no hot metal script types. There were, there were indeed, as I say, but they were all for hand setting, not for mechanical setting. Right. Um, uh, Sarah, can you pull up those slides that I have of... Um... Uh, go to the next slide. So this is oh, the previous slide. So for those people who don't know, this is a set of punches that we have in the Newberry's collection that was used to make, that were used to make metal type. And then this is a wonderful illustration of people actually casting type, which is again, different than linotype by the 20th century. Um, but this is how people made type for hundreds of years. And then can we go to the next slide? Um, so this, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, is what photo composition looks like. Um, you had sort of a glass plate, right? Is that correct? Yes. And then yes. you, had, you had a machine and you still had a compositor, but they simply were able to, to take whichever um, letters they wanted from that glass, from that plate, and then make a composite that they could use. That's right. Yes, what, what you see on the left um, is what was called a grid. Uh, it contains uh, a whole font. Um, in the linotype, uh, linofilm machine, 
you could install a number of them at the same time in a sort of a carousel. <laughs> the, the machine was keyboard, keyboard operated like the old line of type. And essentially, conceptually, it replaced the metal pot, pot of molten metal with a camera. And as you uh, uh, keyed the, your text, um, you, you actually punched a paper tape, which was then fed to the photo unit, uh, which set the type photographically using, as you see, a, a, a negative on, on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, it sounds complicated, but in fact, it was really a rather simple uh, idea. Um, and um, before we go on to our audience questions, how similar is designing digital type to photo composition? Wow, um, you know, having, having lived through, through both revolutions, uh, in some ways, the change from metal to film felt more radical at the time than the change from film to digital. <clears throat> you know, there's a sort of popular conception that we had metal type and then we had digital type. Um, that's not historically accurate because there was this quite long interregnum of film type, um, you know, which, I, which I've been talking about. Um, I, th there were, of course, uh, and I mentioned some of them with my last slide, some things that have come into digital type more recently, digital type has been around for a surprisingly long time, um, but it keeps getting developed. It gets smarter, the fonts get smarter. Um, so the, the, there are many things that we can do in digital types that we could not do in photocomposition, just as there were things in photocomposition we could not do in metal. So there's been a sort of a progression um, I can't say <laughs> it was done by the engineers in the interests of uh, type designers. It was more done in the interests of productivity and uh, technology that matched with, uh, with, with printing techniques of the time. But we type designers uh, were able to benefit from some of these uh, technical advances. Thank you. Um, so I see that we have quite a few questions in the Q&A, or we have some questions in the Q&A. Karin, is there, um, do we have questions? Oops. We do. Um, several people, just to, to start off, want to know why you didn't get royalties for Snell, <laughs> and if you can talk a little bit about that whole issue of royalties for typography and, and whether that's ever affected who you worked for and that sort of thing. Oh boy, yeah, I, I knew I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when I designed Snell Roundhand, I was an employee of Linotype. And Linotype's business was 90% machines, 10% type. The type was very profitable in terms of what had to be invested in it, but it was still only 10% of their business. It was really a machine part. You know, you needed the fonts to make the machines work. When I raised the question of royalties with the management at Minotype, they said, um, if we pay you a royalty uh, as a type designer, we will also have to pay royalties to every engineer who designs a widget for the Minotype machine, and that will run to money. So the answer is no. Um, things have changed a lot since those days. Um, nowadays, I think there is a much more liberal attitude towards rewarding type designers uh, with royalties. In other words, whoever produces the fonts, maybe the designer himself nowadays, they share the risks and the rewards. So I think a lot of my colleagues, uh, younger colleagues, uh, have been earning royalties quite rightly from, uh, from a very early time in their career. The first typeface that I designed, that I earned a royalty on, I was 56 years old uh, when, when, it, 
when it happened. So although I am forever delighted to have been born when I was, because I've lived through such an interesting period, technically the type, I probably didn't choose the best time uh, when it came to uh, benefiting from royalties. But uh, uh, by the same token, I'm, I'm very happy that, that, uh, that young designers who are friends of mine uh, are uh, able to, uh, to earn royalties on their work, which is, which is quite right. Thank you. Um, I do have some technical questions. Um, John is asking, uh, a variety of slant angles are seen in the 17th and 18th century round hand samples. Um, and the angle in Snell round, round hand is particularly extreme, almost a 35 degree slant off the vertical. And he wants to know if this model was selected in part because the extreme slant would require every letter to exceed its side bearing bounds. And so more dramatically demonstrate the phototype capabilities. Was that in your mind? Yeah, I, I, I think he's absolutely right. I think we chose uh, a steeply slanted script because it sort of made our case better. You know, if we had done an upright script, or more upright script, uh, we felt that the uh, departure from, from metal uh, would not have been as, uh, as obvious. And, uh, you know, the, obviously there was a sales aspect of this uh, as so often. So we wanted to be able to show uh, a very marked departure from uh, the hot metal type library. And I think the, the question is absolutely right, that we could have used, there, there are plenty of examples, historical examples of roundhand scripts, which are much less slanted than that, but we did it just as a challenge really uh, to, to show we could. Um, just to speak to that, Sarah, can we go back maybe to slide two so we could see that original Snell round hand, if we can bring that up? just so we can see the slant. Um, uh, 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 what there, right, uh, one back, <laughs> sorry. Right, so you can see the slant, the letters all sort of lean into one another at that, at that angle, which I think is really interesting. Um, but that's what gives it the cursiveness, even though not all of the letters are joined here as well, I think. Should I say a word about these two unfamiliar letters since we've got that slide up on the screen? Definitely. The, you know, the, that thing in the bottom line next to the, what we recognize as the S, is the so-called long S. Um, it was used in those days, both in printing and in, in handwriting, at the beginning of words and in the middle of words. What we regard as an S was only used as a final form at the end of words. Over time, uh, we lost the initial and medial long S. I think partly because it's easily confused with an F and partly because it, it sort of really wasn't necessary. Oddly enough, it, it survives in Greek. You know, they have a, 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 a medial and a final form of the of uh, sigma, but we lost that over time. Um, I would say that by 1800, most printing had dispensed with the long S. You do find it later in handwriting, which was more conservative. I saw the other day uh, uh, a slide, a, a, a reproduction of a, uh, of a, a book uh, that had been dedicated by Lewis Carroll uh, a copy of Through the Looking Glass, uh, which he uh, inscribed to a friend whose name was Jessica. And he wrote the double S in Jessica with a long S followed by a short S. And I think that odd habit, uh, that was in 1897. Uh, so I think that habit uh, survived longer than uh, in handwriting, certainly than in printing. The W is, is very strange. I don't actually know its history, but you see in both Snell's examples, not this one, but other pages in his copybooks, 
and in the work of other writing masters, they used both forms of W, this one, which we find very confusing, and a, 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 an ordinary W, so to say, that's made up of uh, essentially of two Vs. So I'm not quite sure when this weird W uh, disappeared, but over time it was uh, evidently uh, rejected in favor of, as I say, what, what we would recognize as an ordinary W. So other than that, all of those letters were perfectly uh, bread and butter everyday letters to us. And I will say that Snell and his contemporaries at this moment, they were interested, as you point out earlier, in making handwriting for business. So this is really the handwriting of the British Empire, and they were interested in speed, ease, and legibility. Um, so they, and it really, you know, so it is very legible to us, um, and is meant to be written quite quickly. Um, I do, I am fascinated by Snell's, um, uh, his own his own attempts to uh, um, sort of mathematically work out how these letters work as well. And did you find this useful when you were thinking about making um, Snell Roundhand? Did you find his proportions, his trying to work that out useful to you? Um, you know, I, I did not copy this uh, plate of Snell slavishly. Um, I, I had to make various adjustments but, um, it, you know, it, I mean, I, if, if we woke Charles Snell from the dead, he might disavow Snell round him completely. <clears throat> but as, as historically based typefaces go, it is fairly close to its origin. I mean, obviously, Snell himself never designed a typeface. Uh, he, uh, he made... Uh, writing books and as you say they were engraved we know the names of some of the engravers they're highly skilled but he never made a typeface um, so i was not reviving uh, a typeface i was reviving uh, handwriting and engraved copy books but i would say that 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 my version still round hand is you know is it is, is fairly faithful as as they go um, so even though, as you mentioned, and this, um, Snell never designed a um, typeface, those that double F right there that we see is sort of calls to mind, if you're a type designer, it calls to mind a ligature, um, or that AE right there. Um, it, <clears throat> and we did have a question that, hold on, I can't. Um, so, so, and perhaps... I have this question too about photocomposition. With photocomposition, there are no there are no ligatures. Is that true, or am I wrong? Um, you could have made ligatures. There were two difficulties. One was the finite size of the font. You, you there wasn't a sort of elastic font in which you could shoehorn all kinds of different characters. Um, and the other one was, how would you access them from the keyboard? Mm. Uh, both of those reasons um, made it difficult to use ligatures in photocomposition. Uh, they didn't make it impossible, but it was really a, it was really a question of, you know, it, it was more difficult than it was worthwhile, I think. Um, with the coming of digital type, uh, there was a sort of a rush of ligatures. Um, I designed a typeface called Mantinia that has a whole load of uh, two-letter ligatures. Um, that started a bit of a fashion for doing that, I think. And it's very tempting, you know, when you've got the, the opportunity to do that, uh, it's, it's tempting to want to uh, take advantage of it. But by and large, I, I think ligatures were a great rarity in photo composition. Um, Karen, do we have other questions? Yes, we have. So um, Sarah, hold on just a second, is asking, 
Uh, I am curious about the particular challenges of creating script glyphs for non-English languages. Did you develop ligatures or letter combinations specifically for non-English text or even non-Latin letter forms? Uh, yes, um, this is a very big subject. Um, many of the technical advances <clears throat> I've mentioned, particularly the digital ones, actually have much more importance for uh, the Indic writing systems, the Arabic writing systems, the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean writing systems than they do for Latin. We're rather parochial in our uh, <laughs> attitude towards uh, these, these advances. Um, I, I myself have not, I, I've designed uh, uh, Cyrillic and Greek because they're sort of cousins of Latin. Uh, and I did once have the temerity to design a Devanagari for, for Hindi, but I was closely supervised when I did it. I have not tried to design script faces like Snell <coughs> for other than Latin. Um, I wish someone would ask me to do it. Um, it, it would be an interesting challenge. But I'm sure there are other people who have done it. I mean, one of the wonderful things about the uh, spread of the digital technology is that it's made this whole thing, type design, I mean, so much more accessible uh, to people. You know, when I was starting out, it was a very inaccessible business and everyone tried to prevent you from going into it. But nowadays, you know, you can get a degree in type design from at least two universities I know of and, and uh, certificates from, from others. So there are people uh, who are doing, you know, very uh, groundbreaking work in, uh, in pointed Hebrew or Arabic, or as I say, the Indic scripts and so on, but I'm, I'm not really competent to take them on myself. Thank you. Yeah, that, that um, just as a follow up to what you just said, several people asked about how one gets into this profession and if you there, you know, how you got into this profession, what kind of training or apprenticeship or education you had. Um, uh, yes, I, I, for me, it was slightly line of least resistance. My dad was a typographer, not, not a type designer, but a, a book designer and a, a historian of typography. So um, I kind of grew up in that world rather. Um, my dad didn't push me into, uh, into following in his footsteps. In fact, he rather tried to dissuade me from doing it, I think. He said, conversation at the dinner table would be more interesting if I did something different. But I had a year, I was supposed to go to university and I had a year to fill between leaving high school and, and, and starting university. And uh, my parents who were used to having me out of the house at boarding school, arranged for me to go as, a, as a, uh, an intern. Well, actually we didn't use that term in those days, but an unpaid trainee to the Enschede printing works in the Netherlands, um, where they still made type by hand. And so I, I didn't serve a, a, a formal apprenticeship, but I spent um, actually less than a year uh, at Enskede's in the type foundry, learning the rudiments of punch cutting, only to find, of course, that when I went home, uh, it was an obsolescent, obsolete uh, way of making type. And I had quickly to adapt to uh, designing it. But, you know, my case is not typical. In fact, you could really say that for all of the uh, type designers of my kind of generation, I think we all started in different ways. You know, Joseph Moxon, writing in the 1680s, said that he'd never heard of anyone learning it from anyone else. But the people who practiced it learned it of their own genuine inclination. I don't think that's completely true historical because, historically because there were, we know of apprenticeships uh, served by uh, punch cutters, either to other punch cutters or to goldsmiths, people in, 
in related trades and so on. Nowadays, it's, it's a very different situation. Um, as I say, you, you, you could go to the, uh, uh, to the Hague, you could go to Reading in, in the UK, and you can study uh, type design academically. And a lot of students do this uh, and produce very fine work as a result. So it's, it's been a huge change, uh, you know, just over my uh, working life from something that was uh, 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 not easy to get into and uh, probably was easier if you were a calligrapher. I'm not a calligrapher. I can't make the pen go where I want it. Um, but it was probably m most, I would say most type designers uh, of my generation and before uh, probably began as calligraphers. It was easier to go from calligraphy to type design. Now it's easier to go from type design to calligraphy. I mean, anyone with a Mac computer and, and the right software can start designing type. Uh, it's harder to learn to use a quill pen. Thank you. Um, so I think that we just have time for one more question. And again, a number of people have asked various versions of this. Um, they're interested in your opinion on the future of cursive, both in print and in handwriting. And Jill, I wonder if you could start us off by talking about Illinois' return to teaching cursive, because several people have talked about the, the issue of teaching cursive in the school, and then we can hear what, what Matthew has to say about that. Um, so one of the reasons my exhibition came about is Illinois is one of the, I think, 23 or 24 states that now requires the teaching of cursive, which they define as like two weeks in fifth grade. Like it's <laughs> very short. Um, I'm also encountering my first undergraduate students who do not know how to read or write cursive, um, which seems remarkable to me. Um, but, but that has made cursive and that's one of the reasons I'm so interested in script fonts. If nobody learns how to read and write cursive, why do people love script fonts? Um, um, and they're, you know, they're very popular. Um, but students today, young people see cursive um, as extremely exotic. So when I pull it out, they're, they're so interested in it. Um, and they're interested in the origins of writing and sort of the artisticness of it. Um, more so than for the straightforward kind of communication uh, of cursive. Um, and so, um, yeah, that is, that's my take. It's something that the exhibition will explore. It's something I'm looking to think about more as we go along as well. I, I don't really have anything to add to what Jill just said. I, um, I, I think it, it, it's interesting that, that if you show kids cursive handwriting, they love it, you know, they get quite fascinated by it. Um, but they are not, uh, I don't know where Massachusetts stands in all of this, but uh, they're not necessarily taught it. Um, I, I, I don't have uh, uh, much interaction with, with, with young kids uh, uh, on this subject, but I would encourage them to write cursive. And I think that th they are sort of intrigued if they have an opportunity to do it. And I, I, I very much welcome the fact that you're going to have a massive exhibition on all of this. And I hope a lot of kids will go to it and get inspired. Adults too, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think there's something, I mean, you said you, don't, you didn't really do sketches or drawings, but I do think there's something interesting about sort of the hand-mind design connection yeah. too, yeah. with sort yeah. of... Uh, <laughs> you know, getting a sense of something with your hand and then turning it into um, a digital font or something else. So um, I'm shocked that you don't make drawings, I, that you didn't make a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was being slightly facetious there. Um, you know, I, I was at a type conference not long ago and I, and I made some remark about like that, saying, you know, I never make delivery drawings. And a surprising number of my colleagues came up to me afterwards and sort of whispered, well, neither do I either. But there are type designers, uh, I mean, I, I could go down a list, who not only make preliminary drawings, but say you have to make preliminary drawings. Mm. You can't really uh, work digitally on the screen until you've made uh, 
preparatory drawings. Um, they, I think, tend again to be people with a calligraphic background. I, I don't draw very well. I don't have good hand-eye coordination. So rather than doing a drawing on paper uh, badly and scanning it in and cleaning it up on the screen, I might as well draw badly on the screen and clean it up on the screen. And that's what I do. So I don't make preliminary drawings, but, um, but you know, if there are other type designers listening to this, they're probably shaking their fists at me and saying, of course we make preliminary drawings, we have to do so. But you know, it, type design for all the fact that I was saying you could now study it academically, it's, it's a small, it's a small uh, pursuit in the number of people who do it. It's very hard to generalize about it really. Right. Um, I, I do think it's quite ironic that the designer of one of the most famous script fonts of the 20th century claims to not be able to, to not have very good penmanship. Um, um, and for those who are interested, we do have a number of wonderful um, drawings of typefaces at the Newberry, including Bruce Rogers' drawings for Centaur and um, Oz Cooper's drawings for Cooper Black. So I do encourage you if you're interested to come see them. Um, so you said you don't, as uh, just as a final um, uh, parting statement on my part, you, you said before that you don't get royalties, unfortunately for Snell. Um, and I do see it in the wild um, occasionally as well. And as we were preparing for this program, as I mentioned to you before, <laughs> I was, I. I'm sure people are not really gonna be able to see this very well because of my, um, I did find a wine, it's called Rubus um, Zinfandel from California. And as soon as I saw it in Whole Foods, I said, I think that is Snell Roundhead. I'm so sorry that my computer is not allowing us to see it. Um, and I sent it to Matthew and he confirmed that it is probably Snell Black or Snell Bold. So I was really delighted to see it um, out in the world. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know if you have any parting comments about that. Uh, no, I, I, I will rush to Whole Foods and, and uh, try and find a bottle. I thought, I thought it looked- uh, I, I thought, will send you one. I will send you one. No, 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 don't do that. But <laughs> I, I very often judge uh, wine by the label. Not, not because it's a font of mine, but uh, I have a general feeling if, if a winemaker takes the trouble to make good labels, it probably says good things about the wine. And I, I've often been right about that. Yeah. Um, Matthew Carter, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been such an honor and pleasure to work with you over the last couple of weeks. Um, truly, you are like the wing collection condensed into one man. Um, um, and I hope I would I hope that you will consider coming back in 2022 to talk about your ongoing work with your new script font. Um, and with that, um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Karen Christensen again. Thank you so much, Matthew and Jill. I enjoyed that so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming visitors back to events at the Newberry as soon as it's safe to do so. In the meantime, please join us for our next virtual program.